Good evening, everybody. Anybody excited to be here at the Global Leadership? It is so wonderful to be here again. I am so excited, nervous, all that wonderful stuff. It's always exciting to be here. Dr. Monroe, again, thank you for the invite, the Pastor Pender and the great board of Atwila, our president and our vice president. What awesome people we have here. And just to stand here in front of you, it's just it's overwhelming to do that. So I have a task to do tonight, and that is what I'll do. But as always, it is a blessing to be here with you. Are you excited? Yeah. I am too. Uh, my title, my title that I'm given this year is The Leader, Passion and Compassion for People. The Leader, Passion and Compassion for People. And on this slide are the people I'm most passionate about. <laughs> and uh, that's my wife and my beautiful children. Uh, and I'm always blessed to have her with me. Just stand and say hello to everybody. This is Linnell, my sweetheart. We've known each other for... 37 years, married 24. We met in church. So uh, it's good to have her with me. And um, also tonight, there's a group that traveled with us, Dr. Monroe, uh, from Omaha. Would you stand? Omahaites. There's some folks here. You're, you're people from Omaha. And to the rest of you, uh, great leaders that are there, from praise and worship to the leader of our Global Leadership Training Institute, to uh, construction board members, great people who run our bookstore. They're all here, we'll be at our table afterwards. But there's one of them I wanna pay particular attention to tonight. Our senior elder took the trip with us this year. Our senior elder, his name is Winston Lee, and he will actually turn 115 while he's here. No, his birthday is Wednesday, we'll be celebrating that here, but we're so glad that, that Winston is with us tonight. And also watching on the internet, a group of folks in Omaha. And uh, we say hello to you too. What a blessing. And the folks from our son's church in uh, Denver, they're also here. Four or five people. There they are from Denver. Bienvenidos. Amen. Welcome. It's just a good night to be here, isn't it? I brought some, I brought some products, and I'm excited about a couple of them. Our first book translated into Spanish is our ignorance book. Ignorancia, Trans translated into Spanish. You can pick that up at the book table. Also, a great, uh, a great series that we just finished is The Audacity of Earthly Kings. You need to have that change your life. And also, for those of you who like PowerPoints, we're making tonight's PowerPoint available to you also. You can pick those up at the book table. And all of our other family and friends, we'd love to see you at the book table. That's what we'll be after the session tonight. Amen. Good. So let's move on. My subject tonight is the leader, passion and compassion for people. And I want to start tonight with a video. In particular, I think it's apropos. It's a few years old. It's about, few, it's about four years old. And it happened right at the beginning of the crash of the economic cycle in America. And some people say that when America, when America catches a cold, the rest of the people sneeze the rest of the countries, this ripple effect around the world. And it actually has a lot to say with leadership. So let's watch it together. We assume that the individual pursuing his or her own best interest will result in the maximum benefit for society as a whole. Right. And that certainly has right. to be questioned now. Over three days in September 2008, when the financial crisis shocked the world, Queen Noor of Jordan, Sakyong Nipom Rinpoche, and Rabbi Erwin Kula conducted dialogues on compassionate leadership to the partners and senior managers of Goldman Sachs and to the trustees and close to 2,000 students of both New York University and Tufts University. This meeting in New York City in the year of 2008 was a meeting that Goldman Sachs uh, hosted. And this meeting was built around the idea, and here's the words of the reporter, I'll just read it verbatim. We assumed that the individual 
pursuing his or her own interests will result in the maximum benefit for society as a whole. And now it is clear, it is clear and certain that this must be questioned. In other words, it wasn't really greed that brought down America or changed us economically. It was this idea of the dispassionate, the people who really didn't care about anyone else except themselves, what they could gain for themselves and or their companies or their interests. So they brought in the best that they could find. They brought in the queen of Jordan. They brought in a rabbi. And they brought in the Dalai Lama second. And they talked for a week to over 2,000 leaders, mostly financiers, and helped them develop this idea of compassionate leaders. Leaders with passion and leaders with compassion. We are blessed and honored to have a chairman that understands that if we can put into the world on purpose men and women who are not just passionate for themselves, but compassionate for other human beings, we could indeed change and influence the world. That's why we're here this week. What is passion? Passion is an intense emotion, compelling feeling to be with people for this particular seminar. Passion is enthusiasm for connections with people. Passion is the strong desire for relationships with people. Passion, passion is that thing that makes us feel like we want to be with other people for the benefit of ourselves and them. Bill Cosby said this about passion. Anyone can babble, but once you've made that commitment, your blood has this particular thing in it, and it's very hard for people to stop you. Once your passion is out there, it's virtually impossible for anybody to deter you or turn you. What is compassion? Compassion is a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune, accompanied by a strong desire to eliminate or alleviate the suffering. So compassion is a little bit different from passion. It is that same feeling, but it's linked with doing something. Compassion is described as what you do because of your passion. Passion, compassion is action. While passion says you feel something, you think something, you may oppose something, Compassion says you do something about what you feel. There are a lot of passionate people. What we need is to add to our passion compassion to affect the world around us. Right? Thomas Merton said, the whole idea of compassion is based on a keen awareness of interdependence of all living things which are all part of one another and all involved in one another. He said, we are interlinked with one another so that if a butterfly flapping its wings in the Amazon affects all of us, what happens when I steal your money? It affects all of us. When I mistreat my neighbor, when I don't learn how to reconcile with my enemy, it affects us all. Okay. There are at least there are at least 10 types of people that you can help. And after this we'll talk about the 10 types of people you can't help. Doesn't matter how much passion or compassion you have. And as leaders we might as well get this straight. All right? You can help people, read it with me. Number 1, you can help people who are teachable. Number 2, you can help people who respect you. If they respect you, you can help them. Number three, you can help people who 
follow your advice. You can help people, number four, who are not opposed to putting forth some effort. If you're passionate and compassionate, you can help people who invest in themselves. Number six, read it with me. You can help people who have a zest for life. Seven, you can help people who use discretion at choosing their associations. Am I going too fast? No, yes. You, you, you can help people who are particular about their company, who they spend time with. Number eight, you can help people who separate, who, who separate who they are, who separate who they are from what has happened to them. Who separate who they really are from what they're going through. From what happened last week. We're passionate leaders in here, but let's make sure we're not pouring our passion on somebody who's dead. Number nine, we can help people who share our vision. And we can help people who manage their deficits. So here it is. More importantly than that list is this one. There are least, and I have a list of about 55 of these. Because <laughs> I wasted a lot of my time as a leader. I want to give you... <laughs> Ten types of people you cannot help. Number one, people, you cannot help people who don't think they have a problem. You cannot help people who think you are their problem. <laughs> when they've made up your, their mind that you are their problem, you cannot help them. You need to, you need to recommission these people out of your organization because they're in a place you can't help them. Number three, you can't help people who ask for your advice but will not follow it. Do you have anybody in your organization, your business, your practice, your church, your organization, you keep giving them advice, you keep having these meetings with them, and the next time you talk to them, you ask them, so how did that go? And they say, well, it was a great conversation we had, but I decided to do something else. And you ask them, how did that work out? And they say it did not work out so well. But the next day, they come to you and say, hey, can I sit down with you to get some advice? No. You have proven that I cannot help you. You don't follow my advice. Four, you cannot help people who are not willing to work for their own results. It doesn't matter how passionate you are and compassionate. If they're not willing to work for their own results, you will not be able to help them. Number five, you cannot help people who want you to invest more in their success then they are willing to invest in their own. They want you to invest more money, more time, more interest. They want you to give more of yourself to them than they're willing to give to themselves. You can't help them. Number six, you cannot help people who have truly given up. They've given up on life. You can be a friend to them. You can love them, but when it comes to investing into them for the future of your organization, you're going to lose that battle because they have finished in their own mind. And it will be difficult to motivate them. Number seven, you cannot help people who refuse to separate themselves from bad influences. 
Mr. Winston in the back taught me something before my son started to drive. He said, let me help you out, Pastor. He said, I know you're anointed. I know you're called to God. I know you're a great businessman. But let me tell you about raising children. I have raised my own. And he said, this is the way it works. As soon as you give your son the car, this is how it happens. If there's one boy in the car, he says, Pastor, you got a whole boy. He's whole, complete. He'll do what you say. He'll go where you tell him to go. And he'll come home when you say so. As soon as one of his friends are in his car, he said, you got half a boy. <laughs> as soon as two of his friends are in the car, he said, you ain't got no boy at all. <laughs> Your influence over him, if he loves his friends, if he leans on his friends, if he looks up to his friends, eventually he may disobey you. So people who won't separate themselves from bad influences after you've poured into them, poured into them, poured into them, and they still keep the same friends. They still keep the same bad influences. I'm not talking about their spouse. I'm talking about people outside. And they keep the same friends. <laughs> Seven. You cannot help people who refuse to separate themselves from bad influences. Eight. You cannot help people with a victimized mentality. And every time you talk to them about the vision of the company, the vision of the organization, they want to tell you about how bad of a victim they are with life. It's like pouring water into a bucket with holes in the bottom. And you won't be able to get far. Is this all right? OK, stick with me. Number. Nine, you cannot help people with opposite values of yours. If they have an opposite value system than your company, you're not going to be able to help them, regardless of how much passion and compassion you have. It's going to be difficult. And last one, number 10, you cannot help people who refuse to drop their old baggage. Old baggage is a killer in leadership. Some people who work for you, some people who are part of your organization, are more in love with where they came from than where you're going. And that's going to become a major problem in your future. All right? So who are people to your organization? No matter, no matter what you do, doesn't matter what the organization is, people are the key to it. Because without people, your organization would not exist. Without people, whether, they're, whether they are employees or clients, customers, regardless of what we call them, members, without people, your organization would have no purpose at all. It is actually the people who give us purpose. Without people, the purpose of your organization is to fulfill the needs of people. That's why it exists. And here's the truth about business that I learned. It was a $40,000 lesson in business that I learned. I learned that people don't do business with organizations. People do business with people. They do business with people, not necessarily the organization. It's the people in the organization that they do business with. So we have to be particular about making sure that people are very important to us. Make sense? Do you know any leader, do you know a leader that understands people in power? Hmm? Ask the person next to you, say, do you know a leader? that understands people and power. This is a phenomenon that they teach in business school. Here's the phenomenon. Understanding people in power has to do with, number one, studying the way people work. I'm going to finish in a minute. Studying the way people work. What I mean by that is, what they desire in return for their work. What do people really want? Hmm? 
how they perform best. What situation, what atmosphere, what climate do they perform best in? What distracts them from being productive? Once we know what distracts people, what environment they need, then we can build an environment where they can have success. Right? So understanding people in power has to do with these four things. The last one is identifying their individual styles. Because everybody has a different style on how they do what they do. And once we understand their individual styles, then we can set up our companies, our businesses, our churches, whatever we do, we can set it up to match people and their styles and not have everybody live in our rigidity. Okay? What attitudes and perceptions they bring to work, because everybody brings an attitude and perception to work. How they interact with the team. You know, some, some great players out there will never play because they don't know how to play on teams. They don't enjoy teams. They have to play by themselves. Right? And they may be the best player, but they'll never go far because they cannot deal with other people. And those are the last people we should have on our teams until they change, grow up, or mature. Number eight, the nature of their hopes and dreams and desires. The people that are around me and around you, what are their hopes? What are their desires? What, what do they really dream about? I mean, in their heart. Is it really the paycheck for everybody? Hmm? Is it notoriety for everybody? Is it a sense of purpose and destiny? We need to find that. It's a daily search for us, right? Truly effective leaders, when they know these things, what they will do is they will use this knowledge for the betterment of those they serve. Not as a weapon against them. But once we know how someone thinks, what they desire, how they work best, then we can use that information to cause them to be successful in our organizations. Those kind of people know how to hire the best people. When was the last time you were able to see an all-star in action and you were able to get them on your team? Regardless of what you're doing, you were able to get them on your team. And the next day, how everything changed in your organization because you got an all-star. You got a person who don't, they don't just talk about it, they can actually do it. That changes everything. It frees your head to think. It frees your head to create and to, and to spur off vision when we get those kind of champions in our organization. They know how to build effective teams and organizations. They're able to motivate people to produce at their highest capacity. They are very effective communicators to those they serve. This information about finding people at their level is how we build success in our organizations. Still with me? All right, good. Now, if you are a passionate and compassionate about the people around you, there are a few things that we will do. Number one, we will discover. Two, we will dream with them. We will develop them. We will devote resources to them. We will design growth environments for them. We will dare them. And we will deploy them. We'll discover, dream with, develop, devote resources, design growth uh, environments, dare them, and deploy them. Number one, we'll discover them. You know, we've got to become really good talent scouts. We've got to be intentional, not about looking for yes people. We've got to be intentional about looking for talent, people who have a gift to do certain things. 
We have to be intentional about looking for them everywhere we go. In, in the shopping market, driving our car at the gas station, at church, at business, in the marketplace, at ball games. We've got to be looking for these talented people. And once we see them, we've got to not be afraid to say, you know what, you belong on my team. Well, why should I be on your team? You should be on my team because I'm going someplace and I need you. Where you're at now, they don't need you. They don't even recognize your talents and your gifts and your skills. Don't be shy about it. We should recruit and advise them that once we found the talented player, the gifted leader, we should recruit them. We should talk them into being on our team without shame and without fear. Lastly, we need to employ them. Once you've discovered them, you've scouted them, you've recruited them, hire them. Bring them on. And remember, this is why you need to know how they want to be paid. Everybody doesn't need money. Some people need purpose more than they need money. Some people have a desire to change the world more than they do a corner office with a pay package and insurance and a parking stall. Next, dream with them. Share your vision. Engage their imagination. Let them dream with you. Don't be afraid to let them see something in your vision that you haven't seen. Don't accuse them of changing what's in your heart. Don't protect the vision from them. Let them dream with you. Because it's very important, if you got a major player, it's important for them to see themselves in the future of your organization. And the only way for them to do that is to see their dream inside of yours. So you have to dream with them. Develop them. Assess their gifts and their strengths so that we match people with what they do best. Does that make sense? Okay. Train and coach them as you develop them. Tell them and show them what they are doing incorrectly. Better ways to do the same job. It's important. Evaluate skills and talents. Evaluate them. Now that you've assessed them, now it's time to evaluate. Let's, let's look back over what you did and make sure that it's the right thing. All right? Devote resources to them. Invest in their progress. You know, it takes money and an investment of tools so that the great people around us can do great things. We have to invest. We have to expose them and network. We, we have to bring them to places like this and expose them to 50, 70 leaders, uh, 70 different nations in the world in one place. We have to encourage them to come and meet their sisters and brothers from around the world, other great leaders. Expose them and give them access. If they're great, give them access to the people you know, to the things you know, to the relationships that you have so that they, they can be exposed to them and know what you know. Your, your company, your ministry, your, whatever you're doing, Okay, if you're the only one that knows what's going on in your organization. <laughs> I'm sorry, Martin showed up. Look, if, 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 you, if you, look, if you are the only one that knows what's going on in your organization, you don't even have to tell me. I know your bottom line. I know you're not making no money. I know your church is small. No, that's all right. No, no, no.